So Rasha, thank you for the time and, and for making this uh, work for your schedule. We're just really grateful to have you. Um, you know, I want to ask you about um, 9-11 and, you know, specifically your memories um, of where you were when you heard the news. So it was in the afternoon. That day, my mom and I had gone uh, shopping. It was the beginning of the school year. Uh, we had a very, like, we had to wear a, a very specific dress type for the university in Mosul. It was my first year, and it had to be a white shirt. So we went to a very specific shop on the west side of the city. And when we came back home, my dad and my brother were glued to the TV, and they said there's been this massive accident in the United States. I had lived my childhood in America, so and my father is very familiar with the Twin Towers. So for him, it was, this is so sad. These towers are beautiful. And at the time, we thought it was an accident, just a tragedy where a pilot had you know, mistaken and just got ran into the tower. But it turns out that when the second, I was watching actually live when the second plane hit and it was clear that this was intentional. And it was, um, I don't recall anyone I know from my direct family, friends, even our relatives, neighbors, that expressed any sense of schadenfreude at the time towards the American people, despite, the, despite Iraq being under severe economic sanctions that were mostly imposed by the U.S. There was a loss of human life that not, did not have to happen. That's, that, that's my first memory. That's the earliest memory I have before the fallout later. Yeah, I mean, certainly within, you know, 24 hours, the international community will really r rally with the U.S., right? Um, and I wonder if you remember something familiar to that in, in Iraq, just as you were talking to family. Yeah. I mean, again, the, the public perception was that this was, a, this was indeed a terrorist attack. There was a lot of analysis that, well, U.S. foreign policy um, has been at time the aggressor. But regardless, no one said that America had this coming or deserved it. Um, there was never a sense of that in Iraq. It's uh, the conversation about war is always two sides that are, you know, kind of equivalent and at war with each other, not one side, not one attack, not dropping bombs. That's like an unrequited kind of a, an unequivalent kind of war. Uh, but I do recall that um, Saddam, of course, used to be on television every other day in Iraq, and we had only two television channels, so there was no escaping him, really. But after 9-11, he was on TV every single day, speaking about 9-11. And the conversation was that, yes, America's foreign policy and America's aggression, that was his narrative, of course, caused this. But there was, all, there was still a sense of sympathy with the people. And I remember at time at school and even with our family conversations, we would say, can this guy just zip it up because we don't want to be the next target. And at the time, it, we would just say that. Not anyone in their minds, I think, believed that Iraq was going to be a target after 9-11. I wonder if I can ask you about um, your, you know, your anticipation or thoughts about um, this perhaps coming to your country when you were watching what you just mm -hmm. sort of detailed. Was that in your mind at that moment? Or? Again, at the time, like the Iraqi state was very selective with what it would show. So we were not hearing about Iraq being the next target. I think I heard about it the first time on the radio. Uh, we used to listen to Francis Monte Carlo and Voice of America at the time, the channel had changed into Radio Sewa. It was mostly songs and music, but also sometimes like every 15 minutes there was a news brief. And then there, I heard the first time talk about Iraq being next, and we were mostly in denial. Uh, no one really believed it because, yeah, Saddam, as bad as he was, we didn't think that Iraq had anything to do with 9-11 and just the idea that it, was that it had something to do with it. And then there were uh, dem uh, WMDs was... Uh, just, it just was a bit ridiculous. We talked a little bit about this before, but what was the early confusion about whether an invasion would happen? Do you remember when that, when that talk sort of began? It seemed a bit more real. It was around, I think, late 2002, and when the talk became very serious, there was a, a program on Al Jazeera uh, called The Opposite Direction, I believe. Again, we did not have satellite channel, but the state TV decided to broadcast this episode. And it was one, it was, it included a guest. I do recall it was a woman, uh, I believe she was, she might have been Lebanese, and an Iraqi opposition figure. And this was at the, at this point, the U.S. had invaded Afghanistan. And the Iraqi guest was arguing that perhaps America could also invade Iraq and get rid of Saddam, and the, the female guest was opposing his idea, and that idea just sounded outlandish. We had no idea that it was actually in the works at the moment. 
And then after that, the United Nations began uh, meeting constantly. It was almost every other week, if I remember, to discuss this. Protests started around the world. And with a massive international protest at, the, at a global scale, I believe it was on Valentine's Day. And that day was also, there was a UN, um, I think an urgent meeting or an, um, an extraordinary meeting about Iraq. If I remember correctly, the Russian representative at the time did say today is Valentine's Day, let the value of love overcome, something like this. And the U.S. representative, again, if I remember cor correctly, was John Negroponte. I remember watching this. And he was, it, the whole conversation that had just happened was completely irrelevant. He just said that, no, we're going through this war. It's going to happen, something within that context. And then we have taken preparations and um, we will minimize the loss of human life. And that's when it really hit us that this is actually happening. What was your response? I mean, when you realized, how did it feel? For me, for me, as an Iraqi, of course, fear. For me, as someone who lived briefly in the United States and had the most amazing childhood there and only had good, a good perception of America, it was heartbreaking. Um, that it made no sense to me that America did not know that Iraqis in Iraq were absolutely helpless. And that, yes, no one wanted Saddam, but we also did not want a war or an invasion. And we were already very exhausted under the sanctions. So it was, uh, it was fear and confusion. Um, the real moment it hit, it hit us when George W. Bush announced the 48-hour uh, ultimatum to Saddam. I went to college the next day. We went to the student center, had lunch with our friends, and then we said goodbye. And it was um, kind of like tears behind the laughter that we may never see each other again. Or when we do see each other, we might be like a separate state or half of our friends might not be here. We don't know what's gonna happen. And then we just went home and that was it. It was the countdown started and we were just basically waiting for the sirens and the bombs. You had described to me that you saw some announcements on television, um, some yes. public service announcements. Can you describe what you, were, what you saw? Yeah, so on one hand, you had the state convincing us kind of that nothing was going to happen. Um, there would be no invasion. There would be no military. Um, there would be no war. Uh, no U.S. military is going to invade. But then uh, there were like public service announcements of like first aid. And if your house is bombed, how do you protect yourself? Where do you hide? How to make masks just in case you need them? Um, another thing that was very interesting, and I remember just talking about it, I remember it now, it's kind of coming back to me, and especially placing it with the context of Iraq today. Um, I'm, I'm from Mosul, North Iraq. No Mosul is a Sunni majority city. We had no really collective information or, or knowledge of what um, the South was like, what the Shia South looked like. So there were um, representatives from the Marja'iyah, from Najaf, on television, um, condemning the war, condemning, condemning the United States, condemning the international community, and saying that they would fight um, against any invasion. And I, rem I do recall my father saying, they look, it's so clear that they've been forced to do this, probably under threat of the gun, because um, this would not, uh, this is not something normal for Najaf to say. So it was clear that the state was employing all it could, at least at a propaganda level, but also it kind of confirmed that there would be a war. Did you happen to watch the Colin Powell speech in the case that he was making within the U.S.? It's okay if you I, Yes, I remember, I remember the speech. I remember he pulled up something, and I remember um, some of the comments that that's just a lie, and the conversation that the opposition had been feeding false information to the United States. That was happening almost in every Iraqi household. Um, we did not know the opposition very well. They had, they had left Iraq at a very young age, most of them, and everything they had been saying, we, we would listen to their radio interviews. It just made no sense. Um, so that, it was hard at the time. I think the hardest part was seeing that the international community also didn't really seem to believe the narrative, but no one was able to do anything. It was like America was running this one-man show and had already made that decision to invade Iraq, and no one could stop it at the time. What about the narrative of liberating Iraqis? I, it's a bit, here's the thing, it's, um, I, I don't want to um, deny agency for any Iraqi who definitely celebrated when Saddam fell or felt liberated. Um, I know when the regime was gone, I felt that I could breathe, breathe a little bit, that I could say I was finally free, that we, don't, we didn't have to fear 
um, to say anything to, we were, there was a sense of liberation. Um, and however, that was kind of, it was kind of contradictive with the sight of, uh, of army tanks in the streets of a foreign invasion. But I don't want to deny that moment of joy for anyone who did not mind the tanks and felt that the freedom was more important. Sometimes just the concept of when you listen to it, especially now at a much older age, liberating another country, it, it has, a, it can be a bit condescending, uh, slightly. Um, because especially given what happened to Iraq later, uh, the fact that the country was invaded and there was no proper planning um, everything was kind of, it felt that everything was kind of left to chance, you know, we'd let's just take out the regime, invade the country, and then what else? Nothing. Um, everything that happened from there was, was basically a fall down. And early, there's looting, there's violence, there's a lack of security. How did things seem to change overnight? What did you witness or what did your family witness? And from from the second day, um, you know, Saddam, there, we watched as the statue fell on April 9th. By April 10th, we woke up in the morning and the university was being looted. Saddam's palaces, all open, all looted. We saw, um, I remember one site, a, a teenager, no, no way was he older than 13 years old, carrying this massive rifle, just walking in the street. I don't know who that was, who was behind him, where he got the weapon. And all the adults just stood there not able to do anything because he could actually unload it <laughs> into anyone's body at any moment. Uh, that was kind of, it kind of symbolized a lot of the chaos that was going to happen. Um, later on when we, when we found out that, okay, the, the US Army is not shooting on sight, not killing everyone it sees, I think there was a sense of calm because that was our perception of an invasion. We always thought, we thought about Israel and Palestine. And at the time, um, uh, the second Intifada had happened just a few years before. So that was, our, that, that was the fear that this might happen to Iraq. When that didn't happen and we were able to go back to school and we were able to participate in um, kind of cleaning up our own college, I mean, there was a sense of kind of, there was, a, there was cautious optimism that maybe things are not so bad, or if they're bad now, maybe they can, maybe they can get better. Um, and even when the first um, informal Iraqi uh, temporary government was formed, they looked like technocrats, highly educated. But it was when the violence started, when people were kidnapped, when we would hear, we would hear random gunshots at night, and then we listened to the first interviews and realized that this was a government that was completely disconnected to the reality. Um, they had been living so long in the West that the realities on the ground in post-sanctions Iraq and post-Saddam Iraq were so far from what they had known. It felt like chaos immediately. And within weeks we started hearing about, in Baghdad, um, a campaign of assassinations against former scientists and former military personnel, um, and that was a bit scary. Did it appear that the Americans had a plan? Um, from when, we, when the uh, military was disbanded, and I think it was a few ministries as well that were, um, that were altered or changed, and then we started hearing about the debathification. It felt like it wasn't. It looked like it was the Iraqi opposition pretty much in the chair setting the policies and it looked more like a campaign of revenge than building a state. How did you see sort of that, that anger, that hopelessness um, growing in the form of it? It was, it depended on who you spoke to, of course. Uh, there were people that um, were victimized very much by the former army. Um, I remember that uh, we had a, a carpool going to school and the driver said, I used to be a soldier back in, in, in the late 90s. And the, my officer, he used to take my salary every single month. So naturally when the army was disbanded, there was, he, was, he was thrilled. He said he deserves, that person deserves to suffer all his life. I hope he goes to jail. I hope you know, he's charged with corruption or something. And then if you spoke to other people whose father had lost their job, of course, there was a different reaction. It just felt like this social fabric of the country was really falling apart, not just geographically north, south, even within the same province, within the same city. Um, it was almost like an instant us versus them narrative. Let me ask you about the unintended consequences of this period. You know, as Americans fought and encountered resistance, they seemed to push harder and harder. Um, and I wonder if you can help us understand what America didn't understand about the harm it was causing to the Iraqi people and the greater mission here. 
Um, I guess the the figures that come to my mind as you ask this question was um, seeing one of the large striker army tanks. They came into Mosul, I believe it was sometime in 2004. I think they were the striker was just in a hurry and it it crossed a red light and just ran directly into a civilian car killing everyone in it, and it just didn't stop. It was not considered a hit and run. I don't believe there was an investigation. There was just an ambulance that came up later, picked up the bodies. I have no information whether that family was compensated or not, but these incidents happened a lot, and, you, and I don't believe Americans heard about them in the news. And it's, it, imagine this repeating at a scale, not just in Mosul, all over Iraq, um, and then wondering why there's an insurgency, and then wondering why are Iraqis so angry? There was a lack of respect of human life, and that happened even before the invasion. Iraq is, up until this day, Iraq is looked at almost as a geographical space. The population is rarely mentioned, um, and numbers. They tell 20% Kurds, 20% Sunni, 60% Shiites. But what about those percentages? They represent human beings. That's not really looked at. No one really takes them into consideration. Um, that's, that's what I think of. It's just the the lack of respect for, civil, for civilian life. And this is not even mentioning Abu Ghraib, not even mentioning so many other disasters and war crimes. Um, yes, you know, deaths happen in war. Um, I, it's coming to my mind now something, I think an interview with Condoleezza Rice just before the invasion, when they asked her about civilian casualties and her answer was, well, wars happen and people die in wars. And you hear that. It's a narrative, I think, that's, it's a, you hear about wars and throughout history, but when it's your people, your country, and it's being said so casually, um, it's really hard to describe it. I wonder if I can ask you about, um, you know, the impact of that violence on the average Iraqi, on your classmates, on yourself. I mean, what, what that's like to witness that, you know, that level of violence. Uh, it did leave us traumatized, of course, and sometimes this this trauma is triggered in ways that we you don't really think about. Um, I have a very stark reaction when I hear a, a balloon, you know, just like pop off. Like my reaction to it when I hear an airplane coming very close, uh, the sound of a jet. Um, it, I have a reaction different to other people. Um, usually, when people see it. When, hear, when they hear the sound of a jet or an airplane, it's exciting because it means there's an event or a celebration, they look up to the sky. I kind of automatically just shiver and just like, um, it's, it's a very different feeling for me. Um, that's that, for example. Um, other things that just, it, it leaves us very hopeless, I would say. Um, it's hard to take even life seriously after that. We have right now in Iraq, for example, a very high number of suicides happening, especially amongst youth, because of hopelessness. And it, it's a natural outcome for years and years of war and um, nonstop violence. And this is not to say that Iraq pre-2003 was um, utopic in any way. Living under a dictatorship was not fun at all. And it's just, it's heartbreaking because Yes, it might have been an unlawful invasion. Yes, there were no weapons found. There was a dictator that was toppled, and there was that a very slight window opening for Iraq to be a stable, uh, prosperous state. And that opportunity, um, I believe, has been lost for good. Um, you know, we, we jumped over Abu Ghraib, and I just I want to ask you about those images. Um, what, that, what that showed the world, what that um, showed about how far we were Anyway, we're going. Um, yeah, Abu, Abu Ghraib was. Yeah, it was. It was heartbreaking. Um, it was shocking. Um, I I wanted to believe very. I so wanted to believe those pictures were not real. Um, I I didn't want to think that Americans could do this to Iraqis. And um, it was there was some slight relief knowing that there was a trial. Um, but I think they received a minimal punishment. Was it 2.5, 3.5 years only <laughs> of jail time versus a lifetime of humiliation? Um, I recently connected with um, the prisoner who was, you know, put in black, that famous uh, Statue of Liberty um, mocking position, and he's still broken even after all these years. Uh, it was that definitely 
that definitely changed um, whatever hopes that had remained that possibly the United States has good intentions towards Iraq. It was that and the murder of uh, Abira Janabi as well, the young teenager who was raped and then burned with her entire family. That kind of killed it. And uh, it gave ammunition to not only Al-Qaeda and the insurgency, but also to the Sadrist and um, that, the insurgency in South Iraq too, that Americans needed to leave. This was not, uh, this was not a war that they were fighting for us. What was lost in that moment? What was lost was the hope that um, Americans had good intentions, that they were trying to rebuild Iraq, that they were protecting the Iraqi people. It did not look like that at that point. Anyone who still had some hope at that point, I think, was faced with that reality. And it, was it a case of a few bad apples perhaps contaminating? Yes. It, I don't believe, for one, that the entire, all of the U.S. Army um, were bad in Iraq. I don't believe they all participated in, in, in crimes. Absolutely, the majority, in fact, definitely did not. But that was enough for Iraqis to see that, okay, we're, we're not the ones being protected here. Um, let me switch over to Obama and his election. And I wonder if Obama felt like something different to Iraqis. Uh, at the time, yes. Uh, I think it, the talk about peace and withdrawing from, the, from Iraq, um, again, the idea that if America were to withdraw from Iraq, unlike the invasion, it would definitely have a plan. I think our hopes, uh, well, speaking about of myself, <laughs> my hopes in, in President Obama having a plan for the country were dashed quite quickly. Um, less than two years later, uh, the Obama administration supported Nouri Maliki's second term, and he was a disaster for the country. I don't think two people disagree on that at this point. Um, it was clear by then that, no, um, America just wanted an exit without really bearing the consequences or responsibility um, without even um, acknowledging that there was a moral responsibility to, to at least help Iraq get to the next stage of, of security, that appeared that that was not going to happen. So when the U.S. Um, military withdrew, it was very clear that the country, at least from our side, from what we were seeing, that the country was going to deteriorate quite quickly and that violence was going to break through. Um, he doesn't seem to invest diplomatically and the results are that a vacuum is created for other terrorist organizations to grow. Did you, did you see that pretty early on? Yes, yes, of course. When, um, after the U.S. withdrawal, um, and at the time, the, the government, the Iraqi government then, uh, was very emboldened, and it was free to practice, uh, to carry out um, sectarian policies and uh, its agenda was very clear. The Iranian influence definitely grew. Uh, and um, of course, when that happens, you, there's a reaction to that. Also, the Al-Qaeda had went through various stages until it was able to create the Islamic State and, and ISIS and then take over one third of Iraq. It was, it was all very related. I think the signs were there, but there was not so much investment or an appetite to invest in Iraq anymore after 2009. Obama calls ISIS the JV team. Um, mm. What did that tell you? Um, it told me two things. Either he didn't have a clue and I was willing to give him the benefit of the doubt at the time, or he didn't care. And I think right now it was kind of both. He probably was not aware of, of how dire the situation was or what ISIS exactly were. But that was because the, the region and the Middle East as a whole, Iraq in particular, was no longer a priority for him. You witnessed the growth of ISIS firsthand. Yes, in, in 2007, I received uh, a death threat. I, was, I had just graduated college and I was working um, at the governorate in Nineveh, and I received a death threat on my personal cell phone from the Islamic State of Iraq, um, and this was 2007. They were the first incarnation, kind of. And it was just for being a female employee and working in a place where there were American troops at the time, but I was not engaging with them at any level. And uh, it was funny that that threat kind of pushed me towards another path in my career, in my life. And I am in Washington, D.C. today, kind of because of that, of that threat. But that's how, that's how deeply infiltrated they were from 2007 in, in North Iraq. 
and uh, the overtake of Mosul in 2014 should not have come as a surprise. Um, they had they had established themselves deeply um, by 2012. How much had changed in that decade that we were talking about? Everything. Everything changed. Uh, growing up in, in kind of in a bubble of, of stability, uh, yes, it was a dictatorship, and that's why I call it a bubble, is that we were very isolated. Um, we could not think for ourselves. We had our futures kind of determined already. And then all of a sudden, we're connected to the world. There is freedom, but there's so much violence to the point that you can't leave the house even at times. Um, the one thing that remained, I think, constant was under the dictatorship and, and post under freedom is that we were hopeless, that we, we had no real ambitions. Whatever ambitions were died, uh, were killed. Um, I think that's, uh, that's what kind of, that our lives have just not been stable. And I've personally kind of given up on seeing a stable, prosperous Iraq during my lifetime. I, I don't see that happening. I'm not going to live another 60 years to see that, really. I hope that future generations have a chance, though. Um, I wonder if I can ask you, because you're here for the 2016 campaign in the U.S., um, what it was like hearing candidate Trump and later President Trump talk about um, the Muslim ban and what it sort of told you about how much America had come again from this 2002 period, 2003 that we're talking about to 2015. Well, a lot have happened that that led to that led to that. I had I left Mosul in late 2013. I moved to uh, to Dubai at the time. So when this speech happened, I was in Dubai, and initially Iraq was on the on the ban list, and I had planned to come to the United States for a for a conference. Um, and my trip was delayed because of that. And then Iraq was removed from the from the ban. And yeah, it was it was a bit you know it was it sounded familiar. I mentioned earlier the us versus them narrative in Iraq. It sounded that that had become the norm in the United States too, uh, where there was this social division within one country that perhaps had the seeds had been there for a while and kind of left under the rug. No one really wanted to talk about it. But now there was this presidential candidate that was stoking up the, you know, these sentiments, and he had given a platform uh, not to address them, only to incite them. That sounded very familiar. He talked about this a little bit, but I want to make sure I, I, I get this from you, which is that you know, one thing that seems to have gotten lost from the beginning is just the, the sheer death toll of, um, of, you know, of civilians. And yeah. And looking back over two decades of war, um, what does it tell you that the cost of Iraqi lives seem to not be part of the conversation um, here domestically and, and in our media? What, what was sort of the, the human cost of the last two decades? Um, it kind of tells me that America first is not necessarily a, a Trump invention. It's, it's been America first always. What do you mean by that? Well, you don't hear them talking about Iraqi lives. Um, I know some people do, and I know that some people care of, about Iraq deeply, even in this administration at the government level, and they wish things did not happen. But things did happen, and they still are. Um, like I, I mentioned uh, before, there was a protest not too long ago. 700 lives were lost. I have not spoken to an American here who is not like in the close-knit policy circle that has heard of this. I speak to random young people. When the Black Lives Matter movement happened, and I, I would tell some of them, you know, we have protests in Iraq too. Oh, really? When? Did, it, did anyone die? I say, oh, 700. And they all look at each other saying, how come we never heard of this? That's an example of Iraq not being ever in, in the discourse, and it's very hurtful. Because, you know, having to constantly use the death toll of your own countrymen and women just as a way of getting someone's attention is quite humiliating. I understand when you said uh, that hope was lost. Could we be just a little practical uh, also on top, of, on top of that? What was lost besides hope? Families, cities, the destruction, the magnitude of the destruction. 
of your of your country. Please share with us a sense of what that feels like. Uh, so, as it was clear that nation building was or rebuilding was not happening, and that we had now a, a sectarian strife, we had now armed groups killing whoever they wanted, um, we had now Al Qaeda rampant in the country. I remember. In 2006, I said goodbye to seven of my friends. They had, they had decided to leave the country. I don't I don't know where they are now in the world. I've tried to look up their names on social media. I have not been able to find them. Um, the ones who stayed in Iraq, I lost one who lost her life during the war um, to liberate Mosul. So friendships were torn, families were torn apart. Um, cities will never be the same as they were. Um, there's a there's a generation that has grown up that has never known one day of stability in their entire lives. So, uh, of course, hope would be lost amid all of this. I think the heartbreak is that the social fabric of the country, um, it was, it had also, it has always been kind of pretend. Under a dictatorship, they impose a social fabric that does not exist, but you have to commit to it or else, you know, there's the death squad ra waiting right there. But and we had that opportunity post-2003 to build the social fabric. Um, and the Iraqi government at the time failed. The Iraqi people were not prepared for this, for this kind of freedom. They did not understand it as well. And the international community felt that we had done our job. The mission had been completed. Um, and the op that opportunity was lost. And the social fabric forever is has been forever completely, you know, dismantled. It's been forever gone.